Good evening all, and welcome. This world is full of strange and creepy people, most of which we'd rather not meet again, if they fall into the category I just mentioned, which is what we are going to be exploring tonight. So I hope you're ready, because it's time to get comfortable and let the darkness take control. This happened a few months ago. I'm a 24 year old female and probably couldn't defend myself from a 10 year old. I went to the grocery store to pick up some things the other night. When I got to the register, there was a man helping me bag my groceries while the cashier was checking me out. I was buying some dog treats and he asked me what kind of dog I had. I said, a golden doodle. And he said, Oh my gosh, me too. I didn't really get enough vibe from him. But he would stare and not break eye contact at all. I chalked it up to him missing social cues and trying to be friendly. After I paid, he started pushing the cart for me out the door. This isn't uncommon, as they typically help you take your things to the car. I have social anxiety and feel very awkward and guilty for them having to do that for me. So I always tell them that I'm good and thank you. And every other time they've said, Okay, have a good one. When I gave my usual reply to this guy, he said, Nope, I got it, very bluntly, and stared at me the entire time. I instantly got a bad vibe from him. It was about eight at night, and barely anyone was there. He said, Well, my shift's over, so I'm walking to my car now anyway. Weird, because he didn't clock out, but maybe he had before he did this last checkout. He was very talkative in the store, asking tons of questions about my dog and telling me about his. But when we got outside, he barely said anything. I started asking questions about his dog, because I felt anxious with the silence. But I really regret that. He took it as an interest and immediately said, Well, if you give me your number, you can meet him and just stared yet again. Oh, I'm sorry. I don't give my number to strangers. I don't want to say no because I have a boyfriend because he seemed like he might get angry over that. When we loaded all the groceries in my trunk, I was thinking, thank goodness, I can get out of here now. But no, the cart was between me and him, and he was positioned on the driver's side. So in order to get to my door, I would have to go past him. Well, I got to get home. My dog's waiting for his treats. He just stared. I realized I was gonna have to go past him if I wanted to leave. So I looked around to see if anyone else was in the parking lot in case something more happened. No one. I started to get extremely nervous. He could push the cart into me or just grab me himself. I've had this traumatic experience before. And my problem is that I don't have a fight or flight. I just kind of freeze. Just like that, he starts walking away, pushing the car to where they are returned in the parking lot. I take the chance to get into the car and lock the doors immediately. I wish I left then, but I needed a moment to breathe. And I saw in my side mirror him getting into his car. I quickly put the car in drive and drove out. The exit is a stoplight. And just my luck, it's red. I'm turning left. I see his car right behind mine not 30 seconds later. I panicked. But then I thought, he said he's going home. It's nothing. I only live two minutes from the grocery store. I made the turn and he was hanging back. I didn't put my blinkers on for the next turn. and He made it too. The next turn was a stoplight and then the turn for my road. As I get to the light, it's red again. I thought maybe I should drive to a police station just in case. But as soon as that thought came in to my head, the light went green. My boyfriend and I only moved here two months ago. So I didn't think in my head how to get to the station as I'm terrible at using my phone while driving. And I'm not even 30 seconds from the last turn onto our street. Our street is a dead end with only four houses on it. It's very long and we were at the end. No one goes down it unless they live there or are lost. I turn and he makes the turn. I literally just directed him to my house. Thankfully, I have Bluetooth and called my boyfriend. 
I said, a guy from the grocery store is following me. Turn on all the lights, open the gates and let Nike out. Nike is his German shepherd and he was trained to be a German police dog and then got extra bite training. He can hold someone for up to six hours. So now knowing he was outside, I wasn't nervous. I was nervous that my boyfriend wouldn't have gotten the gate open in time and I would have to either sit in my car or get out fast and put the code in. As I pulled in, I saw the gate was open and my boyfriend was on the front porch with Nike on a leash and has his firearm in the air. I fly through and down the driveway and this guy follows. Does he not see the firearm and guard dog? Well, he did at that moment because my boyfriend let Nike go and he charges the guy's car. He jumped up at the driver's window, frothing at the mouth, showing all his teeth and the hair on the back standing up. He looked terrifying even to me, and he was protecting me. I gave Nike his command to come back, hoping this guy got the hint that if he guts out of the car, he's going to perish. And hint he got. He reversed the car so damn fast out the driveway, he nearly hit the gate. I collapsed on the front porch and hugged my boyfriend. Nike got steak for dinner, and I reported the man at the grocery store because I remembered his name on his name tag purposefully. They later contacted me that he had been served his termination papers. I was and still am living in Kelowna, British Columbia. At the time I was 17 and living with my mum but working full time. I normally left the house about 4 a.m to walk into work for 4.30. I started my walk like I did every other morning, got myself bundled up, it was during the winter, put my headphones in and started to make my way to work. I get a few houses down from my mum's place and a guy steps out onto the sidewalk. He shouts something out at me that I don't quite understand because I had my music in my ears. So I pulled out an earbud and asked him to repeat himself. He looked at me with this wide eyed look, and I immediately regretted asking him to repeat what he said. Jesus loves you, he says in this creepy sing song voice. Uh, thanks, I guess. And Jesus wants me to take your life. At this point, my blood ran cold. The street was empty beside us. I was training in martial arts at the time, so I kind of shifted my stance knowing full well I could get my ass kicked, but I still didn't want to show fear. I reached into my pocket and grabbed the pepper spray my mum handed me earlier for when I walked around at such an early hour. I showed it to him and screamed with all that I could to leave me alone. Leave me alone right now, I'm gonna call the cops. Jesus loves you. He said that, half sung, half in a mocking tone, and skipped like an excited child away from me. I walked down the road a bit further and called my parents on the house phone from my cell so that the ring would wake someone up. And when my dad answered, I practically shouted at him to meet me outside with my mum and bring the phone out in case he decided to follow me home. Upon getting there, I called the cops and they told me something similar had happened to a girl my age, and she kept walking. But when she turned the corner, three other guys attacked her and nearly ended her life. Because it was so dark, I couldn't really make out the details about this guy. All that I could tell is that he was high or something. I stayed home for three days and refused to leave my house because it happened not more than three houses down from where I lived. The police couldn't really do anything as I didn't have a description and they weren't sure if the attackers and taunting Jesus loves you guy were working together or if it was just unlucky for the previous girl. I grew up for the most part in an Australian city, but lived with my grandmother in a small country town in rural Australia for a while. This town 
was about a 25 minute drive away from a larger country town that we did all our major shopping in once a week or so. We go into this town to do some clothes shopping and pull up into the shopping center car park, which directly connected to the entrance of the center with the closest car park only a few meters away from the entryway. 10 meters from that entrance, there was another entryway to a standalone store. The store was quite large with many aisles and the cash registers right near the entrance on the left side of the door. We'd finished our shopping in the main center and had gone into the other store to do some shopping. And my grandmother noticed a man who would come in not long after us and was floating around the entrance looking in very suspiciously. We were in an aisle about 10 meters from where he was and me being the young oblivious kid I was didn't notice him and just continued to look at different shirts for sale. I moved further up the aisle and every step that I took closer to the end, he inched a little closer towards us. I didn't notice this, but I remember my grandmother walking up to me and putting her arm around my shoulder and telling me to stay right next to her. I remember looking at an item and asking my grandmother how much it was as I couldn't see a price tag. So I asked if I could go ask the cashier. She reluctantly agreed, but told me to walk straight to the counter and back. As I walked to the counter, he moved even closer to me. It was just left of the door, perhaps five meters from the guy. And I'm guessing he thought I was walking towards the exit. As I only changed my direction right as I got to the counter, all of a sudden, he grabbed me by my left arm and tried to pull me towards him. But as I just changed direction towards the counter, he wasn't able to get a good enough grip of me. And I pulled away quickly. He looked so startled and shocked that he just ran straight out the door and into a car just outside and pulled away. That was it. No number plate, no police, no nothing. My grandma grabbed me and we left. I can't help but think, what if this wasn't his first time? What if he succeeded after me? Or if I'd heard stories of children going missing before and after that, that he was responsible for? Did he spot me while we were shopping earlier and wait for the best opportunity to try it? I hate to think what could have happened and what may have happened after that day. But creepy guy, I now have a baseball bat and I hope to not meet you again. I had recently gotten a job and had more money than I was used to having. So of course, being the fiscally irresponsible 18 year old I was, I was constantly online looking at Amazon and Groupons and just anything to spend my money on. I found a Groupon for a local pizza slash game place just outside of the county of OKC, kind of like a Dave and Buster's, but with a pizza and dessert buffet, among other party place food items. The food was right past the hostess counter on the left and to the right was a room with chairs and booths and anything to eat at. Typical arcade eatery things. Walking past the food and dining area was the huge back area with the games and a small roller coaster. I went with my older sister who didn't seem incredibly into the place, but was content to hang out with me and just spend time together. Looking back, if I had a license, I may not have gone with her and I shudder to think what would have happened. After playing the games, we could and found interesting. She wanted to sit down and eat. We had gone on this simulated roller coaster ride with the double plastic seats and a screen in front of them, the kind that shakes and tilts and gives kids a good time without giving their parents a heart attack on a real roller coaster. She joined me for one of the simulated experiences and said that she felt sick from it 
It's understandable since it's very jerky and our mum has vertigo, most likely passing it down to us. But I wanted to do the rest because it was the most fun we had since we went in. She said I could by myself, but she was gonna grab a plate and wait for me. I don't know what made me get back up, but as soon as she left, I really didn't want to be alone. I'd gotten lost before as a young child in a similar place, so I figured I was just being socially anxious and paranoid as normal. Even though nothing was wrong, I still didn't like being alone in public because I'm just over five feet, barely over a hundred pounds and look much, much younger. I got up, found her at the buffet, about to sit down and hurried to grab a plate and a slice of pizza and a few sweet things. Shortly after we sit down and start eating, a young woman sits next to me. And luckily for her, I'm on the passive end. And while I'm incredibly uncomfortable, I shift over to give her room, mostly just to distance myself from her because I always try to keep my boundaries and don't like people touching me. If she had tried that stuff on my sister, she would have not budged an inch and probably even bumped her off. If it wasn't weird enough that this weird lady sat down next to me, she started acting like she knew us, saying stuff like, I can't believe you guys left me back there. I was calling you. Wow, Erin, why are you ditching us? All the while laughing like we tried to pull a joke on her and she saw through it. My sister looks at me. Do you know her? Even though she's 100% sure that I don't, she just wants to establish we aren't friends and maybe she mistook us for them in some way. I shake my head. Okay, who the hell are you, woman? I'm sorry, but we don't know you. Please sit elsewhere, my sister said. Her words polite, but in a matter of fact tone. I should also mention, my sister practically raised me because we had a single mum who, if she wasn't working to support us, was going out on dates to try and find Mr. Wright. So my sister is amazingly protective of me and an absolute rock star when it comes to weirdos trying to make me feel uncomfortable. And she knows of my social anxiety and boundary issues. So this whole situation is not okay. Don't be silly, we went to high school together, this woman says. Still trying to insist, we simply forgot her. This raises huge red flags for my sister because we moved around a lot from a young age and almost never stayed in the same place for over a year. Not to mention my sister attended high school in Hawaii, Oklahoma and Louisiana. And I attended the same school in Hawaii and a school in Missouri and two others in Oklahoma. We both attended the same high school a few years apart in a very small town, so small that even people in neighboring areas hadn't heard of it. The school that I uniquely went to was in a smallish town and I dropped out when I was 18 because they were racist and sexist amongst other things. I stay quiet, my sister getting annoyed. What was the name of the school? My sister asks, knowing she'll never say the name of the school we attended. Oh, you know, we went together. We even had a few classes. Don't you remember me? She said her name was Bunny and neither of us knew anyone personally with that name. No, I don't remember you. Which school was it so I can try and remember? My sister pressed and the woman kept saying that we should remember her and tried to avoid the question. My sister then got fed up. You need to leave. We don't know you. You're making us uncomfortable. And after a bit more of trying to convince us we were wrong, she got up, huffed off through the door that looked to be employees only. And I didn't get close enough to see if it was the case, but the bathrooms were on the other side and no one went near that door, save a few staff. It was a strange occurrence. We finished eating and considered telling the security guards, but since she was already gone and nothing actually happened, we shrugged it off and went home not feeling like sticking around in case she was lingering. Writing this gave me horrible feelings looking back. If I'd been more independent and got my license and went alone, or if I'd have stayed at that ride and she pushed herself next to me and tries to force conversation, I would have been too awkward to say anything and might have let her go too far. What could her intentions have been? 
My sister feared she might be a scout for traffickers or something, because she kept repeating the same lines and looking around. Perhaps she genuinely thought that we had gone to school together, but in that case, why could she not say the name? I think it's just too odd of a situation to completely discount the fact that it could have had a very nefarious intention behind it. I live in Melbourne, and at the time I was living in a small flat near a popular street called Chapel Street that has a pretty busy nightlife. My flat was located about 100 meters off a main road, just behind a police station, a five minute walk away from the street. And due to this, I always felt relatively safe walking home alone from chapel after a big night out. So in order to tell this story, I have to go back a few months before the incident. I regularly shopped at the Woolworths just up the road from me and was approached by a Jamaican man one day after walking home from getting groceries. He began talking to me. He told me that he had seen me a few times at the supermarket and had always wanted to say hello. I was flattered and we struck up this innocent conversation about what it was like growing up in small towns and moving to a big city like Melbourne. He insisted on walking me home. This was a foolish mistake. I felt a bit uncomfortable about this, but didn't want to come off as rude. So I figured I would just wait till he was out of sight to go inside so that he wouldn't know which flat I lived in, as there were eight in total. He seemed like a nice guy. And when we reached my building, I said goodbye. And he asked for my number. I didn't really want to give it to him as I was already seeing someone, but I figured maybe he was just looking to make friends in the area. He messaged me the next day asking me to take me out on a date, and I politely declined and told him I had a boyfriend. That was the last I saw of him. At least, I thought. Fast forward seven months, and I'm walking home at 1.30am from a bar on Chapel Street. As I'm walking home, I see a guy in the distance walking towards me. I thought to myself, hmm, he looks familiar. As he got closer, I realized it was the Jamaican guy again. Just a weird coincidence, I thought. When he reached me, I said hello and expressed my surprise at bumping into him. This is when things begin to get really uncomfortable. He began telling me how he was at a bar with his friend when he saw me walk past. His friend, after discovering he knew me, told him to stop being such a baby and go talk to me. So this guy had jumped into his car, driven around the corner down the road and parked up ahead in order to catch me. This made me feel uneasy. Come have a drink with me, he said. I've already been out, I'm heading home, it's late. I really wanna just go to sleep, sorry. No, come on, come have a drink. He grabbed my hand. I gently pulled away and said, I'm really not interested in drinking anymore. I want to go home. Please come for a drink. This little dance went on for a good five minutes with him continually grabbing my hand and pulling me away. I thought he would get the hint. Then he changed his tactics. Let me walk you home. No, thank you. He argued this with me for a while, then started repeating, but I know where you live. I don't know how he thought this would magically make me trust him. It only succeeded in freaking me out. And at one point, I remember him saying, screw the police. I can't remember the exact context of this statement though. We argued for a good 15 to 20 minutes before I gave in, a little worried what would happen to me if I flat out told him to piss off. And he ended up walking with me. As we were nearing my building, I had decided I really should say something to get him to leave before he saw which flat I was in. Just as I was about to talk, he said he should go back to his friend. I was completely relieved, but still shaken. He asked for my number again, and I didn't want to say no because I knew he wouldn't take it. And I didn't know if he would get aggressive. If I gave him a fake one, he could test it out before I left. I have had that happen in the past. So I complied, and as soon as he was out of sight, I ran to my flat, locked the door, 
and proceeded to check all the windows were secured. I lived with a boy who worked in the casino and was hoping that he would be home that night. I was very upset to find out he was not, and I called my housemate terrified and told him what had happened and asked when he would be home. He told me he wouldn't be back for another four hours due to night shift and to call the police if he came back knocking on the door. The guy messaged me about an hour after, saying how good it was to see me again, and then text me in the morning too. After calming down and gathering my strength, I replied to him, saying that the way he had approached me had made me quite uncomfortable, and that I would appreciate being left alone. Haven't heard from him since, he's probably not a dangerous guy, I just hope he learnt not to approach women that way after our encounter. It may not sound like much of an ordeal to you, but if you'd have been there and seen everything from your own eyes, you'd have been pretty terrified as well. When I was 11, I lived very close to one of my friends called Anne. She had a little brother named Matt. During summer vacation, me, Anne and Matt would always hang out pretty much every day. Anne lived right across next to this little bridge that went over the train tracks next to her house. Right over the bridge, there was a road that went down to this facility and then connected to the main road. I'm not entirely sure what this building's purpose was exactly, but it was some sort of financial advisement building. Since we were curious kids, we would sometimes go snoop around there and we found this shed right behind it. This was an epic find for us as it became our clubhouse. There was pretty much nothing in there but rusty nails, and it was always unlocked for some reason, but we thought it was cool, and we would meet there almost every day and just hang out, even if there was nothing special to see there. Now one day, I had come to Anne's house, and we were heading down to our clubhouse as usual. Then out of the blue, this random man comes out of nowhere and starts walking towards us. It's obvious we were going inside the shed. Matt's hand is on the doorknob. I'm the eldest of us, Sam being a year younger than me, and Matt three years younger than I. So I was sort of the leader. What are you doing? He asks. He seemed mad for some reason. Of course we had no explanation. We were kids that didn't understand private property, and had just found this cool shed to hang out in. Nothing is the only thing I could utter. He starts lecturing us about it not being okay and kept talking about the important things in there and that we weren't allowed to go in. He made it seem as though he worked there even though he'd just come from the opposite direction of the facility. I now realize he was rambling but it seemed very justified to us because we were scared as hell. It was just weird because I knew that the building was closed. It was Sunday afternoon and all the lights were off but he spoke with such authority we just listened straight up fear. He then started demanding we come with him and starts walking further down the street, saying he's going to call the cops. If we don't come with him right now, we're scared out of our minds and just follow this grown up thinking we've committed some sort of serious crime. He leads us to his house and we kind of stop outside because we've been lectured about going with a stranger and all that since we learned to talk, so it felt wrong and we were hesitating outside, Anne holding her brother's shoulder warily. Our saviour then comes, she's walking her dog, she doesn't even say anything, I don't even think she saw him, but he just closed the door when he saw someone coming. I remember his face so well when he saw this random woman. We were so scared we just ran home immediately after he shut that door, and never cross the bridge again. I was just in Cuba with my family, and we took a tour of the city. There were people asking for things which was completely fine, but there was one man who was quite clearly drunk off his arse, swaying and carrying around a beer. He was being very aggressive and standing right up close to us, poking us for things. It escalated to the point he started grabbing at my sister's baby when he was feeding him, so I got in the way and stopped him. There was an extremely kind Cuban lady who stayed with us and told the guy off. 
extremely kind, considering our tour guide was nowhere in sight. The man proceeded to yell at her, and then began ripping wiring out of a garden, and was trying to hotwire two 220 volt wires, which was our cue to get the hell away from him. I'm extremely grateful for that lady, and watching over my family and making sure that he stayed away. He even got pictures with her and made sure to give her a large sum of pesos as a thanks. I was walking along the sidewalk one day and a guy with a windowless van pulls up beside me and said he could give me a bottle of water if I got into his van, as this was summer and a rather hot day. I declined and continued walking and the guy started shouting and screaming and beating his steering wheel yelling over and over again. It's free. How can you say no to free? I got to where I was going, which was only a few blocks further and was a gas station and had a lovely drink there while talking to the cashier, who was a friend and reported having the exact same situation happen to her. By chance, I was still there late that evening when the shift changed and the incoming cashier reported strange windowless vans idling in the back corner of the lot out of the light. Call the police was what I felt like saying. But as it happened, a rather sizable dude was in the area. He overheard us stopping stories and announced he was going to take care of it. I don't know what happened. None of us three ever saw the van again. Or the big guy, for that matter. I grew up around the world. My parents were divorced, and they had joint custody. So I lived every other year with the other parent. But their jobs required them to move every one to three years to a whole new country. So I'd usually only stay in one place for a year or two. I moved to India in 1995 as a freshman. This was the largest school I'd ever been to. I was fat, pimply and scared of the new school. I'd always been good at making friends. But this school was harder. Most of them lived here their whole life. So it's hard to break into those circle of friends. But a large portion was similar to me. Kids that moved often, although not as frequent. So they weren't as receptive to new kids either. Every fall we did something at the school called a mini course, where everyone in high school had to sign up for a five day field trip. There were tons. It was a big school and seniors got priority of course. Some trips were like sailing the Ganges or hiking some mountain or riding trains to Agra. I can't remember except the two I went on. In freshman year, I went rafting the Ganges. It's exactly what it sounds like. Six kids in a raft with an experienced rafter and we went down different portions of the Ganges and camped in tents. There were two sophomores, RJ and Steve, and they were snooty rich kids, pompous and arrogant. They seemed to take a real liking to picking on me. I'd been picked on before, but this was rough. One morning they tied my clothes together and threw it in the water, tied it to a branch and stuff like that. The chaperone was kind of a jerk too. He asked me who did it and I said, well, if I can't prove it, what does it matter? And he said, that's what I want to hear. I mean, he had heard and witnessed the harassment and never intervened. I was never one to tattle. That's just not something I was raised to do. Anyway, it sucked. The rest of the year, I didn't have any problems. But every time I saw these two, they always did or said something that just upset me were just general bullies, slapping my lunch out my hand unzipping my bag so my books would fall out that kind of stuff. Over the summer, I hit a growth spurt, went on diet and shot up five inches in six months. And with good food and exercise, I was looking pretty good. I even made the basketball team as a sophomore. The coach was the chaperone from the previous mini course, funnily enough, and I had some more friends. RJ and Steve were always into weed. But now I think they were into some other stuff. They looked different next year, acted differently, meaner, generally irritable. They still tried to pick on me, but when I used to walk away, I could feel like they thought they had won. And now I could tell that walking away annoyed them and made them angrier. 
The mini course came around and coach wanted me on cycling some mountain ranges or something like that. And he thought it would be good for my conditioning. So I went and sure enough, RJ and Steve were on the trip as well. I had the room next to them at the hotel and it reeked of weed the entire time. Then we'd go and ride some portions of the hills, then back again and they'd be smoking. At dinner and stuff, they would make jokes about me and I kept ignoring them until one of the seniors berated them for being bullies. They loved it. They laugh. And really, I think they just loved the attention. Going up to my room, I saw them in the hallway. And they threatened me that if I told the chaperone that they were smoking weed, they'd stab me. And I said, haven't told them yet. Why would I do it now? Next morning, I was going to hang back and pick up stragglers since I was riding pretty well. Usually, it was some freshman or less athletic kid in the back. This time it was RJ and Steve. I slowed down for them and told them we only had 10 minutes to get to the stop. Steve, in response, threw a stick at my wheel, then they both sped off laughing. It didn't do anything, but they were laughing as they went around the corner and out of sight. Then I heard, oh, sh and stop. As I came around, I saw them both falling off the mountain and into the trees. I slowed down, looked over the edge, and I could see a branch poking through RJ's arm. He was looking up at me, then down, then up, very confused, and I couldn't see Steve. For a reason not known to me today, I didn't do anything. I kept riding. I don't know why. I was raised to always do the right thing and help people, but at that moment, I felt like they deserved it. I know they didn't, but I thought they did for some reason. It was a real battle in my head. I got to the top of the mountain and the chaperone asked if everyone was okay. I said, I think so, but I didn't see Steve or RJ. I was still unsure why I lied. It was a strange sensation. It was so natural to me. I didn't even feel like I was saying it. The chaperone rode back down the mountain to find them. The other chaperone guided us back to the route we were doing. When we got back to the hotel, they were loading RJ and Steve into a van. This was about two hours later. It wasn't an ambulance. I guess the van was faster. They were bloodied and black in some spots. Steve, whose whole head was wrapped, and when he leaned forward, blood would pour onto his nose like a faucet. Then the Indian guy would push his head back, and I looked right at RJ and didn't say a word. He was on morphine or something was completely out of it. There was so much blood on his pants and shirt. They both came back after Christmas break. RJ before Steve. RJ's arm was still in a cast and his foot was in a boot. Steve had a scar between his eyes where he fractured his skull. It was pretty bad. Something you don't forget. His skull didn't look like it set right, like it had shifted, but it wasn't as noticeable as his scar. I heard them talking to girls sometimes, saying how the morphine felt so good and that they should switch over to that. In general, they didn't seem to act all that different. Anyway, a number of years later, now in my adult life, one of these pair actually wound up getting a job at a company that our company had just acquired. When I was talking to my VP, they told me that one of the pair had actually wanted to talk to me as when they went down, they were expecting to see me. Anyway, I obviously didn't have any intention of going over and seeing what he wanted. And I, for the most part, tried to put it to the back of my mind. Then in 2015, I had to go over to the acquired business for some work. And the thought hit me. And I thought that maybe I'd just pop in to see what it was that he wanted to ask me three years ago. But when I spoke to the project manager, they told me that he had a plan not to get fired, and that he'd made a real mess over at the company. I mean, his firing was inevitable. And once he did, he went off the rails, got back into drugs and ended his own life. I tracked him down on LinkedIn and Facebook. And it was true. 
he had passed. I do wonder though, what his plan to not get fired was. Was it perhaps trying to apologize to me? Who knows? A few years ago, I went to a motel with a few friends. There was a restaurant right in front of the hotel. It was literally in the same parking lot. My friend and I, us both being girls, went to the resto bar around 2am. It was open 24 seven. And some of our guy friends waited for us a bit further in the parking lot. We couldn't see them from the inside though. We get to the resto bar and I feel a creepy vibe right away. There was only one employee, a girl in her mid twenties, and us 18 year old girls and a creepy dude sitting at the bar. The guy looked up at us up and down with a smirk. The girl was just standing there stiff as hell. At some point she said, that's it, I'm calling the police. My friend and I looked at each other, confused. The guy got up and got closer to her. He was about to follow her to the back store, but she put her phone up to her ear and he backed off. My friend and I started walking to the door. I wanted to scream to my guy friends to come and help, but we didn't get the chance because the creepy dude ran after us. Long story short, we found ourselves in between the resto doors and the exit doors. The girl still on the phone ran and locked us out of her restaurant. The guy locked the exit door with his body. He started saying stuff like, you girls are so hot, makes me want to do stuff and things like that. After what felt like hours, the police got there and arrested the guy. We got out of there and they asked us a few questions and that was that. We went back to our guy friends who had no clue what happened. Hey guys, it's Mort here and thank you so much for listening. I hope you enjoyed tonight's creeper stories. If you did, you know what to do. I think encountering these people is always an incredibly unnerving situation. And sometimes I'll read in the comments section people saying, oh, this isn't scary. It's not scary. I would act so differently. And you know, sometimes I think that when I'm reading them, but when you when it really comes down to it, when you're in a situation like that, when you're uncomfortable, when you don't know what someone else is planning, it's an entirely different scenario. And I suppose unless you've been in it before and know how to respond, it can be quite challenging to respond in a logical way. You just usually want to flee. So yeah, I suppose the real fear is when you try and put yourself in that person's shoes. I really do hope that you guys like the video. Uh, next week, so, well, is it like Sunday, the start of the week? Tomorrow, <laughs> should I say? I think I'm gonna launch um, a few cryptid stories, like a few days worth of cryptid stories. Got some haunted wood stories as well, so I'm gonna throw that in next week too, just for good measure. You guys love the woods. Love the woods. Yeah, that's right. So yeah, that, that's going to be happening soon as well. And if you want to join the lovely people on screen, you can sign up to Patreon, link in the description. And for a small amount every month, you get your name at the end of every video and some cool perks. So if that interests you, just feel free to let me know by subscribing to the Patreon service. All right then, guys. But for now, it's time for me to sign off. I'll see you tomorrow. Stay awesome. I'll see you in the next one.